It's Saturday evening. It's time to talk about the very best new cobble books in the world of cobble books themselves with our good friend Drew. How you doing, Drew? Doing great, Wes. Beautiful day here in Indy. Uh, but let's talk about some great comic books today. Well, first we need to talk about what's going on with DC Comics. It's been real weird for a couple of months, and I know this is going to go on at least until August and I believe September, where they basically cut down their publishing line almost in half. They're releasing in between 42 and maybe 45 books in a month at max, whereas Marvel is still doing in between 80 and 90 books a month. And it's been real crazy because you would have thought of DC Comics just like cut out 20 or 30 books they didn't think were worth publishing. We wouldn't be getting stuff like Blue Beetle or we wouldn't be getting stuff like Outsiders from Colin Kelly and Jackson Lanzig. So that hasn't gotten better. There's just a ton less. It's really strange. You would think with the concept of quality over quantity, you would be expecting that, OK, we're going to be putting out more quality books and not the quantity like Marvel. They forgot that other half of the equation, you know, where it's like, OK, we actually need quality creatives. And the problem with that, it all comes from the leadership making these decisions on the creatives. And they are piss poor. And it just shows that they're they're checked out. They're ready to cash. They're ready to pull their ripcord on their golden parachutes and call it a day because these are not quality books. You know, there are a few hidden gems there. You know, we are going to talk about Green Lantern this week and. Action Comics, to me, while not great, was certainly worth reading. We're probably not going to cover it here in this particular show. But it's the rest of the stuff is just bad. Batman is bad. Detective Comics is not very good. Titans is a really abhorrent series at this point. Wonder Woman's not very good. It's almost like you can't even point to a corner of the DC universe that really delivers quality with any type of consistency at this point, outside of maybe a couple of creators Jeremy Adams is really the one that I would point to right now, and maybe Josh Williamson, but we still got this really terrible Batman and Robin book this week from Williamson. Jeremy Adams is the one big guy right now. He is the guy who's producing quality. But the other guy, I know we don't, we don't like to talk about him, but Mark Wade. Mark Wade is the other talent there, but Mark Wade is Mark Wade. Pretty much right now it's one out of two, I think, that are really doing the quality stuff there at DC. There has to be accountability. And it's not there. That is the key word for DC Comics. That's what they need to get accountability. And it is gone. They don't care about the quality of the books, just just as long as they're out there. As long as they're somewhat legible and we have a hot cover, a hot variant, and a hot 1 in 100, people are going to buy it. It doesn't matter. And it shows. That's why we're critical about these, because we care. And they're, they're not good books. This is this. I have never seen DC books in such a piss-poor state as since the DC universe, the DC new universe, when they had Superman with a buzz cut riding a motorcycle and the uh, emo Lobo and the Robo Bunny Batman. We're, we're back to that level. This is almost seven, eight years ago, and it, it's sad. Especially with all the work they put into a DC Comics Rebirth, where they said, you know what, we, we made some mistakes. We're going to get back to the core concepts of the characters. We're going to bring in the best creative talents possible. You know, I guess it was uh, six years ago at this point, but it seems like it was a lifetime ago since we had a nice, thick stack of DC Comics worth reading. And I just don't see it turning around because of all these... Uh, just terrible creators and just bad, weird decisions on the part of the editorial staff. You know, we mentioned Blue Beetle, but Josh Trujillo, I believe this is the second or third volume of Blue Beetle that he's done. None of them have ever sold, yet they keep making it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, people are gonna, people will probably get comments in the video like, oh, I, I buy Blue Beetle. Well, congratulations. You're the one, you're the second, you're the third person buying this. And I know for a fact no one is buying the Spanish because they're putting out a Spanish version of the Blue Beetle as well. And I do know no one is buying that version. No one cares. No one likes his character. I mean, they've, they've tried. Jim, Jim Lee, Jeff Johns, they have tried since, since an infinite crisis back in, what, 07, 08, to get this character over. It's just, it's never taken. It, it just doesn't work. People love the Ted Cord character. People love Ted Cord and uh, Booster Gold. They love, those, they love that dynamic. That's not this new guy. It just doesn't work. Accountability. It is gone. The people in charge here should not be making decisions. Yeah, it's the strangest thing. Josh Trujillo is on his third volume of Blue Beetle, and we still haven't had a Justice League book, and we wonder what's going on at DC Comics. But getting into the good stuff, because there were six comic books that we definitely want to recommend this week, starting out with Red Coat number two, Ghost Machine via Image Comics, Jeff Johns writing, Brian Hitch on art. I was a little apprehensive off for the first issue. I was like, I don't know, is this character even serious enough? But I'm starting to buy in here. There's a great moment where you've got a teenage Albert Einstein, and you've got uh, Simon Pure fighting these guys in Red Hoods or whatever. And Albert Einstein's like, wait, we should run. And he looks over his shoulder, and Red Coat is already over the fence and running without him. I was like, well, I guess that encapsulates the character. And he's definitely starting to grow on me. 
Yes, uh, like you, I wasn't the biggest fan of issue one. Uh, I know some people thought it was the best book of the the line the, of the lineup. I didn't. <laughs> Rook was clearly, but yeah, issue two is, was better than one. Uh, we got the introdu- introduction of more historical figures in this. I thought it was interesting. Um, it's not my favorite book of the week. I'll say that it's it's entertaining. The art is really damn good by Brian Hitch. I'm curious to see where it goes in the third issue. We're getting more of the character of Simon the the, the, the immortal, and just uh, seeing just how morally repugnant this guy is it's taking a turn in the good direction uh so yeah if you could do a heck of a lot worse than checking out red coat introducing benedict arnold was probably pretty smart <laughs> yes it was yeah that was fun next up we're going to recommend tmnt untold destiny of the foot clay number three eric burnham writing mateo santa luca on art i consider this almost like a dream lineup when it comes to writer and artist on there although i guess they're not quite mainstream i'm enjoying this story but it got a lot more interesting in here. We've got the Foot Clan and Karai trying to figure out what the destiny of the Foot Clan is supposed to be. There are pretenders to the throat, or she believes them to be pretenders, this Dogstar Clan coming in here, and we finally get some untold past about the Foot Clan itself that maybe they do have a claim to the throne, and then Karai basically using magic to go into the afterlife and learning some very interesting information and learning how to use, use magic. And I quite enjoyed the book. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah, it's more of a, a backstory issue, learning about the history of the Foot Clan, and learning about the brothers, you know, who are pretty much vying for power. And uh, I, I appreciated that. I like that. Hey, because I, I have three younger brothers. And, uh, well, technically, we're, we'll get into that later when we talk about Ice Cream Man. This one was, was really good. And uh, I did like learning about the history of the Foot Clan because I only know so much about it. And seeing how it started with, you know, this family, okay, that was a lot of fun. And the art is really damn good, too. Um, I like the twist along the way, like especially toward the end where it's going to go. Uh, yeah, this is a very fun issue. Do, do check this one out. And Eric Burnham needs more work. You guys need to be giving him more opportunities because I think he's really got it. Moving over to Boom Studios, Uncanny Valley, number two, Tony Fleek's writing, Dave Walker on art, another real all-star creative team on this one. And this book is just trying to steal my heart here. We've got this little kid. He basically finds out that his grandpa is Yosemite Sam Although in the comic book, he is Pecos Pete. And we've got all these crows showed up in the last issue trying to get to him. His grandpa saved him. And this kid's going, what the hell is going on here? My grandpa's a cartoon. And we do get an explanation why people don't quite see grandpa the way that the boy sees grandpa. And we end up with these great moments. I think they're dingoes. But basically, it's Wiley Coyote. And the grandpa is just like (laughs) pulling guns out. He's got painter's kit and all that kind of stuff so they could paint like a tunnel on the side of a freaking mountain or whatever. And it's, it's a ton of fun. I love it. You don't get a lot of fun in comic books, but this is the epitome of fun in comic books. It, it's there. It draws upon the fun from those Tex Avery Looney Tunes cartoons from back in the day. It really draws in that wackiness, that craziness, you know, just the pulling things out of nowhere. And uh, you said Wiley Coyote. It just it, it brought out the inner it brought out the inner kid in me where I was smiling reading this. I was enjoying this from page to page. Um, yeah, I do love the family dynamic between uh, the grandfather and the grandson. And it's a great moment in the car when he's trying to figure out, like, hey, if I'm like one fourth or one half of, you, of cartoon, how come I don't show it? Then, like, uh, his grandfather shows him a little physical trick, what he used to do. It's great stuff. Um, yeah, the, I, I, I'm sorry. I love, love, love Wiley Coyote. And I love the Wiley Coyote stuff in this. I got a great kick out of it. it it's terrific. Um, do check this out. This comic will bring out the inner kid in you, and you will be smiling from ear to ear, from page to page. Do check out Uncanny Valley. Definitely, and be looking out for the moment where they get in a car wreck and see what the grandpa turns into that the kid can. It was absolutely brilliant stuff. Uh, Speaking of something that's a lot less fun and certainly a lot more serious, Image Comics Ice Cream Man 39 W. Maxwell Prince writing Martin Morazzo on art. I've really enjoyed Ice Cream Man over the years. Really cool horror anthology. This is much less horror and more, I don't know, true to life, where you have a family, a, a mother, a father, Two children in the back seat. Basically, they're dying over the course of like five seconds, which is what the entire comic book encompasses. And they're talking about what's going through the father's mind and the mother's mind and the son's mind and the daughter's mind. Pretty heartbreaking stuff here. Really, really interesting take on that. And you just can't give W. Maxwell Prince enough props for being able to take a story like this and make it work. Also, this story is about decompressed storytelling. He opens mm-hmm. up about talking about decompressed storytelling and how, I mean, we, we, we know, nine times out of ten, decompressed storytelling is boring and it doesn't work. It's stupid. Like, guys like Scott Snyder, Jason Aaron, Brian Michael Bendis, it's all de- decompressed storytelling. It's not fun. 
But here, he really shows you, like, th- what we're seeing is encompasses in five seconds. Each person is experiencing in those five seconds over a, like, a lifetime what's happening. And they're experiencing different parts of their, their lives, whether it's the future, the past. And it's heartbreaking stuff. It, it really hit home for Kyle and I. I know that because uh, we had a, our youngest brother died in a car accident. So reading a book like this, and it really, it, it really struck me as a it's horrific in a way. Because you're seeing like what could potentially happen, you know, those leading up to your death, and um, it really does hit home just uh, how emotionally grabbing it, it can be from certain perspectives. These guys, these guys are terrific. How how this book wasn't even nominated for an Eisner just shows you how corrupt the Eisners are. Ice Cream Man is a terrific series. This is a terrific issue. It's, it pulls at the heartstrings. It's horrific from a certain point of view. Um, it's part one of two, so I can't wait to read part two of this. Do check this one out. Yeah, that was a, a very interesting thing. You know, the exact antithesis of what Uncanny Valley is, but so both certainly very readable and excellent comic books themselves. Going over to the big two, we have a Marvel book and a DC book to recommend. We'll start out with Marvel Doom number one, Jonathan Hickman writing, Saford Green writing and illustrating on this particular comic. Didn't really know what to expect out of this one. You know, it is a one shot. In truth, it should be called Doom the End. That's basically what it is. And my goodness, this thing is a fucking powerhouse. They really put some amazing concepts in here. And and Sanford Green really is the MVP of the book. Apparently, he's the one that outlined the story and obviously illustrated it. And Jonathan Hickman came in and finished off the script or whatever. But we see the end times, what happens to Dr. Doob as he decided he was going to take on a very insane Galactus who'd given into his own hunger for planets and he started devouring things too quickly. Dr. Doom tried to stand up to him. It didn't go well for him. But Val was out there and she has found Dr. Doom. She tells him what happened, all the stuff that happened after he failed trying to stop Galactus and enacts another plan to try and stop him again. And this thing is absolutely grand and epic. There's a final speech from Dr. Doom at the end that basically reads almost like a Viking saga type story. It's basically poetry there at the end. And I'm very excited. I'm going to do a a full review of this on the Patreon exclusive to there. But I was really blown away by the quality on this book. Not expecting it. Yeah, I completely agree, Wes. I was shocked by this. Like when you, I saw Jonathan Hickman involved in this. I'm like, I'm getting ready to, I'm getting ready to just like smoke with you guys. It's going to be a long read. So I'm waiting for some like uh, info bubbles and just some info text graph pages. It's going to be boring, but no, quite the opposite. And uh, I enjoyed this from page to page. The art is beautiful. The stakes in this are amazing. And by the time you get to the end of this, it's just shocking. Your your stomach, your stomach will sink. It's just like, oh shit. That's where we're going with this. Holy crap. Because you just realize what Galactus is and what he represents and no other choice but to uh, accept it. It's such a damn good read. And honestly, I think this is good. this is probably going to go down as one of the best Galactus stories ever. It's definitely one of the best I've ever read. It is terrific. I know it has like an $8 price tag on this or $7.99. It is worth the price of admission. Do check this out. It, it will shock you. It will surprise you. Because this is a story that I didn't think Marvel would let their creators tell anymore, especially an ending like this. And uh, I do recommend check this out. Marvel can do good books. And this is case in point. This is a terrific book. I have highly higher recommendations for, for this book this week. Absolutely. That, that was an amazing experience reading that comic book and, you know, having a really good time just breaking it down, obviously, on the Patreon. The final recommendation that we do have is from D.C., Green Lantern, number 11, Jeremy Adams writing Sir Monaco on art. After a bit of a down issue with number 10, not that it was bad, but it wasn't quite as good as Green Lantern had been. Really a bounce back here with issue number 11. Lots of things going on here. Obviously, the big thing going on with the Green Lanterns. Hal Jordan is like, well, listen, we need to go expose Theros for what he is. We know that he's destroying central power batteries, and we even see him destroy the central power body of the star sapphires in this particular issue. And he's there when it happens. We do get a big twist when they arrive to present the evidence and basically overthrow Theros. Things are not exactly what they think they are. And they basically expose themselves to being caught. And there's also a side story where Carol Ferris is trying to move on from Hal Jordan. And she's thinking about to the last time that she was in Vegas when Hal had stole a car as a kid. And she's going to Vegas to basically elope. A lot of things kind of intersecting in this one in a very, very, very good comic book. Yeah, and surprisingly, it all both plot lines might up, might wind up coming together by the end of this book. 
pretty interesting. I'm not going to say what happens, but uh, it's pretty interesting. But yeah, I, I do like that, how Carol is trying to move on. I do, because Hal is Hal. He's just not a guy to settle down. He's going to have, I'm sure, the type of guy who's going to have like a different lady in a different town. And I do respect Carol for doing that. It makes sense. She doesn't want to keep, keep being strung along along the way. Yeah, I do love the United Plan stuff in here. And I do love how the, the main bad guy in this, as they confront him in the council chamber, he's just like, yeah, I did this. Yeah, come on. Of course I did this. And then it just turns into full-on anarchy. Very, very, very enjoyable. And Jeremy Adams, he is a terrific, terrific writer. He's only getting better, only getting stronger. Clearly, in our opinion, I think, you can agree with me, Wes, the best writer at DC Comics right now. He needs to be getting more gigs. Do check out Green Lantern, guys. It's veered right back on the correct course. And I cannot wait to see where we go to in the next issues. If DC wants to turn around and they, they've got JSA, they're going to need a new creator on that, put Jeremy Adams on that. Let him be in charge of it. And at least one of your problems will be solved at that point. So those are your best comic books of the week. We got four indie books, two mainstream big two titles. But there's also some other stuff out there. Drew and Company with Unholy Nightmare has some more wares to be sharing here today. Correct. Yes. Uh, Dallas Fan Expo next month. Uh, we will have one cover by Gabriel uh by Gabriel Mangum, great artist, and he's he did a homage to Image Crossover Week when the uh, Cyberforce and Spawn crossed over. Cyberforce Eight and Spawn Twenty Five. He did an homage to those two covers with uh, these two covers here that he illustrated and colored differently. This is a preview edition we're going to have, not the full issue. It's a preview edition at Dallas Fan Expo. I'll be there. Aaron Sparrow, the editor, will be there. Murphy Leduc will be there. Yeah, all of us can sign it. Gabriel Mangum can sign it. This will be the first time selling the hard copies at a show. Do not miss out, guys. This is going to be the hottest indie book of the summer. And definitely want to give a huge uh, tip of the cap to Drew for joining us and talking about the very best comic books. If you would like more reviews and conversations around comic books, if you want to back us over on Thinking Critical Patreon, you enjoy what we're doing, and you want to support us moving forward, we want to get back to you with lots of extra podcasts with more reviews and conversation than you could possibly ever imagine. If you haven't checked out Thinking Critical Patreon, there's a link in the video description. I do hope to see you there.